And this will continue to be a Times Now campaign. Meanwhile, as the country's focus remains on Ladakh, the process of disengagement, sources have told Times Now, will be a long-drawn one. While sources have reported a thinning of troops by both sides, in eastern Ladakh, the Chinese presence in Pangong So, Galwan and Depsang continues. Today, after the defense minister's return from Russia and the army chief's return from forward areas of Ladakh, the two met for an hour. The army chief debriefed the Raksha Mantri on the situation in eastern and northern Ladakh. But while all of this happens, there is still a fog around the events of June 15 in Galwan. You've heard several conflicting versions so far. But for the first time today, we will get you an assessment from American intelligence of the Galwan face-off. It's confirmed for the first time on Indian TV that 35 Chinese soldiers, including the commanding officer of the Chinese troops, was killed by the Indian Army in Ladakh. And this is what has been confirmed by intelligence from America to national security correspondent of U.S. News, Robert Paul D. Shinkman. All right, joining us now on the News Hour Agenda, we have Paul D. Shinkman. He is the National Security Correspondent with U.S. News. Thanks very much, Paul, for speaking to us. We've been following your reports here very closely up, uh, about what happened at Galwan in Ladakh, and especially when you've uh, spoken about what the assessment of the U.S. intelligence is. Now, speaking about specifics, what have your sources in the U.S. intelligence told you about the number of Chinese casualties and on what have they based this assessment? Yeah, so this has been a very difficult story to track, certainly from when it first happened. Uh, as I'm sure your uh, viewers have been following, the Indian government has been somewhat forthright about what took place. The Chinese government has not. So we have to rely largely on uh, uh, confidential sources who have been assessing the situation from the outside to figure out what's going on. The sources that I've been speaking with um, who are familiar with the U.S., Intelligence assessments say that at least 35 uh, Chinese troops died in the uh, course of this incident last week. On what has the U.S. intelligence based this assessment? Have they seen movement? Have they heard chatter? What is it? I'm afraid I can't go into too many details about uh, what my sources know specifically and how. Uh, is there also any confirmation about whether the commanding officer of the Chinese army was among the casualties? The commanding officer of the Chinese army. So that that's yet unclear. Um, China has been very opaque with what has been going on with this circumstance. It wasn't until almost a week after it took place that an editor with its state media acknowledged that there even were casualties at all. Uh, yesterday, a senior minister said in a meeting with other Chinese ministers acknowledging that there were casualties. But they have taken on to rather extreme lengths to cover up the aftermath of this incident. Um, the sources that I've been speaking with have said that the funerals for the troops who have, the Chinese troops who have died, are going to be conducted in private, you could say in secret, in as a part of its broader attempt to try to uh, attract as little attention to what happened as possible. But what about the families of those who are of the deceased? So again, traditionally, those are things that would be a little bit in the in um, China that would be a little bit more overt. Families might be able to attend. There might be some sort of uh, military recognition that, from what my sources have been saying, does not seem to be the case here. These funerals are really they're trying to keep them uh, very much under wraps. Also, uh, from the conversations that you've had uh, with your intelligence sources. Where exactly is China positioned right now? Because there is a great difference in perception about their exact location, whether they're at the line of actual control, whether they're on their side, or whether they are on Indian territory. I mean, it's the fundamental problem with disputes of this nature is that it's taking place in territory that both sides either claim as its own or claim does not belong to the other. So the getting to a sort of sure point on 
the extent to which one side has actually crossed a hard boundary or not is exceedingly difficult. This morning, the BBC was reporting that um, there is new satellite footage showing encampments that appear to show the Chinese side on um, the opposite side of the LAC. And um, it's something that we've been following closely. I should say that this is not certainly not an isolated incident to what took place in the Galwan Valley, uh, the Garwan Valley last week. We've been seeing Chinese incursions throughout that uh, that stretch of its border between India and China. But we've also been seeing Chinese movements on a much larger scale as a part of at least what sources in the Indian government have been telling me uh, appears to be a broader pattern of encircling India and certainly extending its military and economic influence um, throughout South and Southeast Asia. Now, the reason that the Chinese military, uh, Chinese government has not uh, revealed the number of casualties that army has suffered, you say in your report, is because they fear that other adversaries will perceive them as weak or that it could result in humiliation. Could you care to elaborate? I think Yes, indeed. I think one of the most interesting things about uh, um, this situation is who is making the decisions. The general who's in charge of the Chinese general who is the commander of their Western Theater Command, General Zhao, uh, is among the few combat veterans that uh, are still serving in the active duty senior ranks of the Chinese military. He began his career as a young officer with the Chinese fighting in Vietnam in 1979. And he's overseen previous incursions with um, uh, border disputes with India, including the Duklam standoff in 2017. My sources say that he assesses that he, he personally believes as though Chinese leaders mishandled both of those events and that China lost face in the course of doing it, that they were seen as being perceived as weak or uh, not strong enough to be able to achieve the goals that they set out to. And he is the senior leader who appears to have um, at least uh, carried out these orders to put these Chinese forces in place um, where we saw the clashes last week, um, and then making the decisions for where they might go elsewhere. So it certainly seems as, as though this is part of a broader narrative, a broader message among senior Chinese leaders to try to send this image of uh, strength. So this is not just about India, this is about China warning every country, including the United States. This is just the playground. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, this comes at a time you might have seen the U.S. National Security Advisor uh, uh, Robert O'Brien last week said that the U.S. is withdrawing U.S. forces from Germany and that among the places that they would uh, be deployed instead is the Asia Pacific. So this comes at a time of sort of broad movements of global powers trying to exercise control or perhaps even just more influence hmm. over this shifting part of the world. You look at uh, Chinese territorial disputes also in the East and South China Seas, um, but also, for example, its new uh, uh, economic cooperation um, corridor with Pakistan, where it's trying to get more stable routes that can go from the west of China uh, directly to the ocean and undermine some of those choke points in the uh, Southeast Asia um, seas that had been points of contention before. Hmm. So in, in your reports, you have said the estimate of the Chinese soldiers dead is between 35 to 43. Now. The Chinese propaganda machine has been in overdrive talking about how they used uh, clubs with nails on it, etc. What can you tell us if you have information about the kind of fight back that India put up? So remember, this is an area that is very heavily regulated. I've been speaking with experts about the agreements that govern, insofar as there is governance, this contested territory between India and China. And there are heavy regulations in place about communication, for example. There have been previous incidents where uh, a single jeep seemed to be out of place and both sides called for communications to discuss what was happening there. Because of those regulations, there are clear rules about the presence of explosives and firearms there, which is likely the reason why if 
either side did indeed um, have them, that they weren't employed during the skirmish because they knew that that would be uh, a, a bridge too far, to borrow a cliche, that that would escalate the circumstance far higher. So what did they do instead? Um, the Chinese side at least um, showed up seemingly prepared. The initial estimates were that they were using improvised weapons in this fight rocks for example keep in mind this is intensely steep terrain with fast flowing water nearby some of the casualties seem to have occurred also from falling off of that terrain and into the water subsequent reporting has also showed as you say that they also came with bats and clubs that had spikes through them some reports i've seen uh wrapped in barbed wire uh one analyst told me if any of your viewers are familiar with the TV show Walking Dead, where the uh, people are battling zombies. It was the mm. kind of weapons that you would see in that, to use sort of a, a macabre example. Um, so a couple things. I mean, it shows just the level of brutality that occurred during uh, this fight, but it also seems to show now that we know a little bit more about the kind of weaponry that was there, that this has not just happened. This was not just a mere escalation of forces who are operating in good faith. This did appear to be something that the Chinese military at least was prepared and indeed even planning to escalate. So you would say that this was a planned ambush? So our sources say that uh, General Zhao, who we talked about earlier, that he gave orders to the Chinese troops who were there to first off be in the region at all, and that he approved their uh, escalating um, their encounters with Indians akin to what we saw play out. You know, keep in mind, this is a military, unlike many others in the world where central authorities and nation's capitals delegate authority down to commanders on the lowest level, empower them with a sense of what the goals are and then let them make their own decisions. That is not the way that things work in the PLA and the People's Liberation Army. All of the decisions, particularly to do with troop movements, come from something called the uh, Central Military Commission. Mm. It's a highly regulated institution in Beijing, of which I should say Xi Jinping, the country's president, is the head of that commission. Um, there is no way that there would have been a movement of troops to this part of the country without, uh, at the very least, they're knowing about it, but most likely they're having approved those orders in the first place. Uh, now. You've described how the Chinese troops came armed with knives, rocks, improvised weapons of the kind that we've seen in Walking Dead as well. Uh, what about India? The fact that they suffered substantial number of casualties as well, 35 to 43. What do you know of the kind of fight back that India put up? So we're, we're still figuring out exactly how this uh, took place. There were some initial reports that the first physical encounter between the Indians and the Chinese side took place when uh, in the aftermath of a mutual decision in the weeks before, so this was earlier in June, before June 15th, the day of the actual encounter, there was an agreement to de-escalate and to withdraw from the area, and that the Indian side first approached the uh, um, a planned meeting place on June 15th, small delegation, unarmed, with the idea that they would be met by a similar delegation, also unarmed on the Chinese side, to discuss the particulars of leaving. That they were, the Indian side was instead met by a much larger force of um, Chinese forces. And that was when the first physical fighting took place. Once it became clear that was taking place, Indian forces rushed in to um, assist their comrades and fighting escalated from there. There's been subsequent reporting that we haven't confirmed independently, but I've seen with a few other sites that a, a part of the encounter that led for these two sides to meet also was the fact that there were new um, tent encampments in place in areas where both sides had agreed to withdraw hmm. and that uh, at least the Indian side was investigating that. I should say that the Chinese government has asserted that the Indian side has also begun installing infrastructure in um, uh, contested areas that it had agreed to withdraw from as well. Uh, finally, I want to ask you, in your assessment, General Zhao 
found that in the past dealings with India, especially recently during Doklam, the Chinese government was found wanting. And this time he decided to take matters in his own hand. This, in a sense, was a sort of um, redemption, an attempt at redemption yeah, by him. Yeah, well, the analysts and sources that I've been speaking with, I mean, who knows what's what's in the mind of this man? I certainly don't. But the way that his actions have been carried out certainly seems as though it was designed and the backing that he would have had to have from Beijing. This was clearly designed to send a message to India that China is a nation that is prepared to in, uh, enforce its interests um, with by force if it needs to. But keep in mind also that India is not an island in terms of allies. This comes on the heels of the US investing very heavily in trying to bolster the partnership between at least the US and India, both for military cooperation purposes, but of course also for economic reasons. Would you say that uh, India has surprised China with the kind of response and the fight back they got? I don't know. I don't know. I, it, it, it's hard to tell the extent to which uh, China would have predicted what's happened. I think it's interesting the fact that they, so if, if any time you're going to send forces into some sort of physical confrontation, there's an expectation that somebody might get hurt and indeed somebody might die. The fact that the Chinese state spokespeople have been so reluctant to release information and have been uh, reportedly attempting to underplay the fact that there are these funerals for Chinese soldiers does indicate that they did not expect the outcome as it um, played out this time. Whether that's because of India's actions, I'm afraid I couldn't say. All right, Paul DeShinkman, thank you very much for sharing your information Thanks. and your analysis with us. Thanks. Glad to be here.